Let's go back in and edit that file. For data in star.txt do, I'm going to indent a bit so you can see what the body of the loop is. This is what I've been trying to type at the command line for the last five minutes. But it's saved in a file. So that if I make a mistake, for example, if I forgot to put the last day on data, I haven't wasted all of my effort. I can come back in and re-edit this file. I saved a bunch of commands in a file. And now I say bash, please run it. And it goes off and it reruns the commands in that file for me. So I've now created a way to build my own commands. If there's something I'm doing over and over again, I can now take the commands that do it and stick it in a file and reuse that file with one single command. I don't have to remember how I did something. Once I figured it out, I can take all of these pieces and create one chunk that I then remember. Count.shell, count.sh, shows me the number of distinct occurrences of each species in all of my data files. That's one fact instead of, in order to get that count, I have to do a for loop over star.txt where I echo the file name and then I get rid of the species and I cut based on commas and I sort so that it, duplicate lines are adjacent and then I use unique-c to get rid of the duplicates but keep a count. That was at least nine, maybe ten things. I ran out of fingers. Okay. That's way too many things for you to keep in working memory at once, along with all of the other stuff you're trying to do. So now that we've worked it out, we boil it down and stick it in one place. That becomes one unit for remembering, one unit for sharing. This is something we could share with other people. If we're going to do that, though, let's go back in and add a comment. Comments start with the hash sign. Um, display the name of each data file and the count of the number of distinct occurrences of each species in that file. Okay. Now there's an explanation of what this command is supposed to do. It took me less than 10 seconds to type that. I typed quickly. It would take 30 seconds, but now I can remember that in future or I can look it up. I've got a script. I don't remember exactly what it did. I've left my future self a note about what this command is for. My future self will be grateful. Bash count.shell. Okay. This is pretty useful. But look what happens now. Bash count.shell pipe to grep. Let's get rid of all the lines that contain the letters txt. Once I've got this command, it's no different from any other command. It can be used just like any other Unix command. Its output can be saved to a file like this. Or, as we just saw a moment ago, it can be piped through grep or sort or things like that. Whoops, what happened there? Well, I just created a file called unique counts.txt. My shell script is looking for things of the form star.txt. So now, when it runs, it's processing Carla 2011, Carla 2012, Jerry 2012, Steve 2012, and unique counts.txt. Oops, I should give it some different kind of file name or I should have named my data files differently, or, and this is the right answer, make dear data move, let's get rid of unique counts, move star dash star dot text into data. So now I've got my shell script here, and all of my data files are in the data directory. So let's nano count dot shell one more time for data in data slash star.txt. Now notice, here, data is a variable, but I'm going to expand down here. Here, data is the name of a directory. 
That's bad practice. For data in data slash star.txt is just going to confuse people. So let's say for file name, echo file name, and grep v species file name. This is just good programming hygiene. If I say for data in data slash star.txt echo dollar data, I'm using the word data in two different ways. It works because the shell knows that in one position it must mean a variable and in another position it must mean a directory name. But that's going to confuse human readers. Um, you've all heard the term fractal. You may not realize that Benoit Mandelbrot invented the word fractal because he was reviewing a paper which said at one point, the density of dense matter, or sorry, the density function describing the distribution of dense matter in interstellar space is everywhere dense. And at which point he thought, yeah, we need some other words here because we've just used dense in four different senses in a single sentence. Here, I've now changed it so that the variable that refers to the thing we're processing, the current target of the loop body, is file name. Number one, it's more accurate than just data. Number two, there's no confusion with the directory name data. So let's save that and say bash, let's run count dot shell. Okay, that's what I expected. Notice that the file names are now listed as data Carla 2011, data Carla 2012, and so forth. Now, I could run this and save it to um, count output.txt. Count output.txt is in this directory, but my shell script is looking in the data directory, so that if I rerun my command, it still only processes the stuff that's in the data directory. It doesn't get confused by the fact that I've got another text file in some other directory. And this comes back to data hygiene. If you've got a directory full of data files, Either they're all of the same type, they're homogeneous so they can all be processed at once, or there's something in the names that makes them easy to select, or you use different file name endings like .dat, .text, .rec for record, and so forth. The cleanest solution is to say that all the stuff in the directory has the same format when you've got lots of data files. Put your results somewhere else, and that way you'll never get confused about what's an original data file and what's a result file. So. What have we seen so far? What we've seen is the way that experienced programmers build a useful tool to save themselves work. First thing I did was play around on the command line to find a sequence of commands that got me the right answer for one file. That's grep, cut, sort, unique. Your data pipelines will look different, but the same idea applies. You're going to play around interactively, building up a sequence of commands step by step, checking intermediate results to convince yourself that it actually works. Once you've done that, you will use history and send the output of the history command to a file, mycommand.sh, uh, regenerate figure 3.1.sh, whatever you want to call it. You'll use the history command to make sure that you're getting an accurate record of what you did rather than typing it back in. We'll then edit that file, which contains either a single command or a bunch of commands, and if need be, wrap them up in a loop or something like that, so that you can reuse that tool. Once you've done all of that, you've got one thing to remember the next time you need it. The next time you have to process files like this, you'll have a script that does what you want, you'll know what it does, you've left yourself a comment in it to remind yourself of what it does, and you have high confidence that it's doing the right thing. This is not my laptop. This one is much nicer than the one I travel with because I'm tired of having laptops stolen and broken. On my laptop, I have a directory with several hundred little tools I've built up over more than 20 years of programming. I don't think it's any different from a carpenter who shows up with a toolbox full of those things that she uses most often. Yeah, there's specialized tools that are out in the van that she might have to go down to the hardware store and pick up a few things, but most people have a toolbox with the hammers and screwdrivers and a couple of dozen other things that they use every single day. And you'll find that you build up this same toolbox. 
as long as you build it up in steps so that you have confidence it's doing the right thing, as long as you get the computer to repeat things, either using the history command or using a for loop when you've got to process lots of files independently, as long as you put comments in things to remind yourself of what it's doing, you'll save yourself hours and then days and then weeks of repeated work and rework. There are things you won't need to do by hand again, and there will be many more things that you don't need to redo because you got them wrong the first time. What we have found over the 14 years that we've been running software carpentry is that the techniques we're showing you will save most people, there are obviously big error bars here, about 20% of their working time. It'll save you a day a week. None of it is rocket science. All of it makes your life easier and lets you get back to doing the research instead of stumbling over the, the 151 data files that you need to process today, except you thought there were 152 and you don't know which one's missing. Okay. So at this point we'll break, and when we come back, we'll be switching topics slightly. Thank you.